Okay, everyone, this will be chapter 18 from the body of Christopher Creed. Mrs. Creed sat down slowly on a couch under the window as Mr. Ames shut the door. Her eyes shifted to him and back to us. She firmly stuck out her chin high, but her voice was shaking. Fine, I'm here to listen. She looked like listening was some sort of military pain test that she was being subjected, subjected to, and she would endure it because she was a great American. Mr. Ames sat behind his desk and said, Tori, you've known Chris since you were born, practically. I would like you to share any thoughts that come to you. Sylvia, I want you to hear this from another student. That wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Well, I hunted in my brain for something not too awful. He was a good kid. I mean, he would never have thought to do drugs or cut school or curse somebody out. He better not have, Mrs. Creed said with a grin that died as fast as it came. She had her legs crossed, arms folded across her chest, and she wouldn't look at me. It's like these loud mouth remarks were always on the tip of her tongue, and she was just trying extra hard right now to hold them back. I wished she had tried harder with Chris, but he made it difficult to be a friend of his. I leaned forward. I feel that, I think that he never had a chance to learn how to be a friend. She swallowed. I always encouraged my children to be kind. Oh, he was, I said quickly. But not hurting people and knowing how to get along with people, they're different. He was different. She stared at her corner of the couch like a robot and spat out robot words. I wanted him to be different. I did not get into the Naval Academy by being like everyone else. I blurted out, I can see why you don't, why you wouldn't want him to be like some kids. But what's the matter with me or Alex? Her face flushed like maybe she knew for once that she'd put her foot in her mouth. I didn't want my son doing drugs or staying out late or hanging out or making other bad choices he would pay for later. Well, I stayed out until like three sometimes, but only at Alex's or Ryan's. I had been drunk a few times, yeah, but I didn't feel like a future convict. Isn't there some way you could have thought of so he could have friends but not make bad choices? She just stared at this corner, all totally proud. Mr. Ames had been rocking in his chair. He stopped mid-rock and said, Sylvia, I would not be putting you through this if I thought the Richardson boy killed your son. He twisted around in his swivel chair when he, she didn't respond, and he laughed awkwardly. I wouldn't put you through this if I thought Christopher was no longer with us. A tear fell over her eyelashes, but she wiped it away almost as soon as it dropped. She glared at Mr. Adams. I know what you think. You think this is another Digger Haynes reenactment, she said. You think my son, like Digger, is out there. And you're afraid if I don't stop pointing the finger that I'm going to end up suicidal like Bob Haynes. No one has ever proven that Bob Haynes committed suicide, Mr. Ames said quickly. No one knows where he is today. But yes, Sylvia, I think that. He trailed off and stared at his desk clock like he was agonizing inside. I realized this was only the second time I'd heard anything about Digger Haynes. Yet Mrs. Creed knew about it. And as soon as she mentioned it to Mr. Ames, he knew right away too. It was like this big secret story all the grown-ups seemed to know about, but no one talked about it. Mrs. Creed squirmed uncomfortably. I don't plan on winding up dead, Glenn. I have better ways to cope, she said quickly. I would love to think my son is out there. Do I look like the morbid type who would prefer to think the worst in an awful case like this? Not at all, Glenn. There's only one problem with your theory. My son could not have written that note. What makes you so sure, he asked. I know my son. My son was happy. My son had a very good life and he was happy. She said that part twice, like for emphasis. And if he didn't write that note, what's the conclusion, Glenn? Somebody else wrote the note. I shuddered, reminded of some ancient school teacher cackling at a kid in class. Mr. Ames cleared his throat, but before he could think of something to say, Allie piped up. I don't, 
I just don't think he could be so happy watching everyone in his class go to dances and parties and he wasn't allowed. Mrs. Creed stared at Allie like she was crazy. Chris was allowed to go out. We offered to drive him to the dances. I even signed up to chaperone the dances before he said he wasn't really into them. How could I object to the very dances I offered to chaperone? This woman was an enormous stone wall. I wondered what she would make of it if one of us shared a bright question like, do you think your offering to chaperone had anything to do with Chris not being into it? Or, hey, great, what's better than driving to a dance with your mom, going in with your mom and leaving with your mom? My dad chaperoned a couple of dances Allie started out casually in like sixth grade. If Mrs. Creed got it, she didn't keep it. I know my son. I also know that quintessential powder keg some people lovingly call the boondocks. I was raised down there, don't forget. I was a boon once. I remembered hearing a few times over the years that Mrs. Creed was raised in the boondocks and that she'd had a very hard life. But it never struck me as anything important. This time my eyes stuck on her as I watched her mouth move. They're not the victimized, misunderstood little darlings you make them out to be. Sometimes, Glenn, my father was a drunkard. He used to tie me up with ropes and hang me upside down from the tree outside my bedroom window. After all the beatings I took as a kid, don't try and talk to me about any boon being incapable of murder. Don't you think you're generalizing a bit, Mr. Ames asked quietly. Not about Bo Richardson. Are you forgetting what Mr. Richardson did to my Christopher last year? Mr. Ames sighed. I shifted around some more, and Ellie was sucking air in and out like there was no tomorrow. This felt all wrong. There didn't seem to be too much to say. I didn't need the graphic detail about Mrs. Creed being hung out with ropes to dry. Give her some unfair advantage in my mind. Pushing him over the bleachers is bad, Sylvia, but it doesn't amount to plotting a murder and covering it up, Mr. Ames said. I've had problems with Bo Richardson, but he takes care of a lot of younger children at home, and he's not a good and responsible, and he's got a good and responsible side as well. Don't forget, I've had problems with Chris too, Sylvia, and I've also given him every possible break. In other words, Mrs. Creed should lighten up on Bo, due to the fact that so many teachers and principals had to break up fights thanks to Chris's obnoxious streak. Well, it's not my fault that other children saw my son as an easy mark, she shrugged it off. And need I remind you, there is a boon sitting in the Steepleton lockout, lockup who confessed to extortion and my son's disappearance. I blocked all bad thoughts out of my mind and repeated what I had said in the cafeteria. I made the phone call, Mrs. Creed. That's the truth. How now? It's not. She stared at me so sure, so unshakingly confident. She even broke into a snotty laugh like I was oh so stupid and didn't get anything over on her for a minute. I went on in frustration. Mrs. Creed, Bo knew you were mad because he pushed Chris off the bleachers last year. He was afraid you were going to accuse him of this just because of the bleachers thing. He wanted to go into your house to see if we, he could find evidence of what really happened. I made the phone call so that he could get the evidence so he wouldn't go to jail and so everybody who counts on him could have a chance at not going down the tubes with him. It was me. I did it. That's the truth. She stared at me like a corpse. I could not read her thoughts to save my life. Allie cleared her throat. Her voice still shook and I wanted to throttle her for her voice shaking because we needed some strength to fight this woman's unblinking sureness. And Mrs. Creed, I was with Bo when we moved that file onto the computer disk. We got it from the library. It was already in the library's files. All we did was move it, I swear to you. Now you listen to me, Mrs. Creed was up and hovering over Allie's face so fast it looked like a military maneuver. Mr. Ames stood up, but she kept right on, almost nose to nose with Allie. You people can sit here and tell your lies until hell freezes over. I do not care what you say or what your agenda is. I care about one thing, taking that boondock kid who destroyed my life and making sure his life gets destroyed next. She draped her handbag over her arm and straightened up stiffly. Thank you for this most enlightening conversation, Glenn, about chaperoning dances and curfews. 
Oh, this sucks, my brain screamed. But her exit line to us was, Bo Richardson is going to hang. It took a minute for her choice of words to sink in. My psych teacher would definitely have called that a Freudian slip. A fire lit in my ribs and I jumped up. I went to shout at her that hanging an innocent kid wouldn't erase her own childhood hangings. By the time I found my voice, she was already gone. She's the criminal, Mr. Ames, I blasted. She doesn't break into houses. She just breaks into lives and steals them. Between her and the cops, I trailed off because of how he was staring into space. I noticed for the first time how tired he looked. Digger Haynes was my friend, he said, so softly. You would have thought he was talking to the wall, not to us. Digger was my friend, and I guess I should have known that at some point it would happen again. It had to happen again. What do you mean, I asked, he said. Only that nobody learned a lesson. Nobody stopped believing that other people were more guilty than they were. Why do people have so much trouble seeing their own faults, but such an easy time seeing everyone else's? He didn't answer, because I knew he wasn't really asking me. It was just a question that he put out there, but a truth struck me. Mrs. Creed would rather believe her own son is dead than believe she is at fault. I would never have imagined that a human being was capable of so much denial. By the tired look on Mr. Ames's face and his last comment, I figured he must feel that she's not the only person out there capable of that. He was thinking of a few others, maybe Digger's dad, Bob Haynes, maybe even our own chief of police. Well, that was chapter 17. Was that 17? No, that was 18 <laughs> in the body of Christopher Creed. Thanks for listening.